This is the Comics Alternative Manga, a look at various horror titles. You're all invited to a party. Come along now. Let's go down to the haunted house. Gonna be a party there tonight. All the zombies who dig cha-cha-cha. One o'clock, they're gonna come in sight. Cha-cha-cha. Cha-cha-cha. Cha-cha with the zombies. Cha-cha with the zombies. Have you ever seen a swinging ghost? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Manga. I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. And we're two guys with PhDs, or working on PhDs, talking about manga. And on the October manga episode, we thought that since this is the month of Halloween, we would take a look at several horror manga. Uh, we're going to begin with Hideshi Hino's Hell Baby. After that, we're going to look at the collection Fragments of Horror from Junji Ito. After that, Portis by Jun Abe. Then we're going to move on to Usamura Furura's Lychee Light Club. Then we're going to wrap up with two recent publications from Kadansha Comics, The Black Museum, The Ghost and the Lady Book One by Kusuhiro Fujita, and then Neo Parasite F by a variety of different artists. But before we get into those discussions, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Manga is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some wonderful specials. Sometimes those specials could be... 45% off the cover price, sometimes as much as 50% off cover. But you know, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. And like in the month of October, you can get books like Massive, Gay Manga, and The Men Who Make It, which I really highly recommend for 30% off. And you can get volumes of Nabuhiro Watsuki's Roroni Kenshin, those Viz Big editions of that, for 30% off as well. Yeah, so you can find great discounts on a variety of manga titles as well as non-manga comics simply by going to the website of Discount Comic Book Service, and that is dcbservice.com. You have to go there for all of your comics and manga pre-ordering needs, and after you do get your books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Shay and Derek sent you. Well, Shay, here we are uh, just a few days away as we record this from Halloween, and we should let our listeners know that th this is a little unusual. Now, if you're a regular listener of our monthly manga series, you know that Shay and I always look at two manga titles a month uh, because, you know, we're, we're busy guys. We have a lot to do, so two is probably the right amount to handle for that monthly show. We went a little crazy this month. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's just say it. Uh, in deciding to uh, discuss six titles, and we thought it being the month of Halloween, why don't we look at horror manga? Because there's there's a lot to choose from. I mean, this is a rich genre in in manga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Um, a couple of the the mangaka we're going to talk about, and the books we're going to talk about uh, this month are by some of our favorite cartoonists not just in in horror manga but in in manga in general i know both of us are, are really big fans of um of jinji ito for example mm -hmm. so uh yeah horror manga i think is an incredibly incredibly rich uh genre that uh, i i always enjoy enjoy reading yes uh definitely and you know as you said we're going to be looking at some classic Manga. Now, when we were making our decisions on what to discuss for October and, and which horror titles to look at, um, some of our decision was based on what was available. 
because mm-hmm. it, well, and also I guess the longevity of a series, right? I mean, those were basically mm-hmm. the two criteria. So, uh, it had to be a manga, that, one of the ones that we discussed, that was available to us either in hard copy or preferably, uh, you know, still in publication, still in print, or available digitally. And there's a lot of mm-hmm. cla- there are a lot of classic titles that just aren't in print anymore and are difficult, if not impossible, at least for us to find in English translation. Um, another mm-hmm. thing we had to keep in mind in our decisions for this month is, especially if we were going to look at more than two, we wanted to keep the series containable, and there mm-hmm. are certain titles, for instance, you know, Drifting Classroom, that you mm-hmm. and I have been wanting to discuss for a while, multi-volume series. That'd be too much to handle for a show like this. And there are a lot mm-hmm. of examples of horror manga that last for multiple volumes, but we decided to look at titles that were contained in just one volume, or in the case of the Black Museum, the Ghost and the Lady Book One, the very first in a volume that mm-hmm. is just beginning. So we, tr- it, it sounds like we're discussing a lot. Actually, we are discussing a lot, six titles, uh, mm-hmm. but we, we tried to keep it relatively containable. Yeah, and uh, it always gives us something, you know, you mentioned a drifting classroom and Kazuyo Umezu, who you know, authored The Drifting Classroom and other books like Karate Boy, is a figure who I think will pop up uh, a few times in the, the conversation today. But, um, you know, that always gives us a, uh, more stuff for, for future Halloween episodes. Exactly. Or, or even non-Halloween. That's true. You know, we've, we've talked about Junji Ito and books like uh, I Am a Hero throughout the year. So um, That's right. Yeah. Horror is... is There's too much horror to be contained just for one episode. Right. You know, we do have a lot to discuss this month, so why don't we go ahead and jump into the discussion? Mm-hmm. Right, and you wanted to start with, uh, I guess, the, the oldest and the, the, the most classic of the books we're, we're going to talk about today, um, which is Hidishi Hino's Hell Baby. Correct. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, this was originally published in 1989, but the edition that we're looking at is published by Blast Books, and mm-hmm. it came out in 1995. Now, mm-hmm. um, this is the only book that I've read of Hino's. I know of his Panorama of Hell. Have, have you read that? Mm-hmm. No, I like you. I'm, I'm kind of familiar with Panorama of Hell, but um, this is the first book of his that I've actually gotten a chance to read. And uh, because much of it is, is out of print or difficult to find, I think – uh, the book I – the copy I picked up is is, is secondhand, um, and uh, so I've always wanted to, to check out his work, but I I've, haven't really had an opportunity until now. Uh, but uh, yeah, how did you – how did you find it? Um, I mean, was it because it's, it's it's kind of a weird book? It is, and you know, I got my copy. I think I got it new when it was still in print and available uh, several mm. years ago. And what I was doing is, I think, just doing you know a general search on Google. Mm-hmm. manga classic manga and i think this was a number of years ago when i first started reading manga because of my kids they were reading a lot mm-hmm. of the popular titles and i checked those out and i wanted to search out titles that weren't necessarily contemporary but were a little more legendary let's say had a little uh, history behind them and hell baby mm-hmm. was one of those titles that i kept finding references to so i got a copy and you know we should you know I mentioned that this is published by Blast Books. We have read something from Blast in the past. Uh, earlier this year, we discussed Sir Hiro Maruo's uh, Mister Arashi's Amazing Freak Show, and I think we made reference to it. And that is a yeah. Blast book. Is Blast Books still around? Um, I don't know. It was a it was a publisher that I wasn't familiar with. Um. And and I've I think you've 
read Mr. Rashi's uh, amazing free show, but I yeah. haven't gotten a chance to read that. So this is the first of theirs that I've I've seen. Because um, we were, because like we were, yeah, we brought it up in the context of Maruo's uh, uh, Panorama mm-hmm. Island. Panorama Island, yeah, and um, it looks like I just did a quick Google search, and it, it appears like they uh, do, which is unusual. And just looking at their Wikipedia page, because it seems as though their catalog consists mostly of nonfiction prose, but then they also publish a book by Suhiro Maruo, and then. Hobby by Hideshi Hino. <laughs> yeah. Which is, is, is a weird kind of eclectic eclectic catalog. But, yeah. um, you know, we should mention that Maruo is one that we could well include on a horror theme show. Right. And, um, you know, we can talk about this a little later, but reading uh, Light Chi Light Club, um, there were a couple couple images, a couple panels of that that struck me as, as being very reminiscent of what I've seen of Maruo's. Um, Ultra Gash Inferno, mm-hmm. and so uh, you know he his work is is absolutely something that's consistent with a lot of the stuff. Maybe not Junji Ito's work, but uh, some of the other uh, books we're going to talk about later in the episode. So exactly, I because agree. yeah, and you, you mentioned in that the uh, the, the Light Chi Light Club that and to a much less degree, I think uh, the first book of the Ghost and the Lady, there is an erotic component to it this is definitely mm-hmm. the case with the light Chi light club which we'll, we'll get to eventually but um, mm-hmm. we don't see that in in some of the other titles um but, mm-hmm. but but let's get into a discussion of hell baby and you know the story is fairly simple when you pull back and look at it in its entirety so basically what you mm-hmm. have uh, the story begins with the birth of twin girls and one appears normal you know by by you know mm-hmm. most people's standards uh the other one is disfigured physically and there's mm-hmm. something wrong with her she breathes heavily in other words she's born as, as many people would call a freak uh, a monster is mm-hmm. what she's referred to and the father mm-hmm. is just shocked and he doesn't know what to do with this and in order to i guess help his wife what he ends up doing is taking uh, the, his new newborn daughter, uh, the one that was born deformed, and depositing her in a junkyard. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the junkyard is referred to uh, the as the world's graveyard. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, you know, in, in true horror fashion, we have things, so to speak, headquartered at a graveyard. And so what happens is that with this baby... She dies, but then things happen in the graveyard to where she becomes reanimated, and she goes through a process of learning to survive and then is lured by the outside world. Some drive inside of her uh, forces her to seek, at least eventually, beyond the world's graveyard where she is living into the city and once there she is driven to find an answer to something she don't know she doesn't know what it is uh and in order for her to survive she must uh consume meat so she she attacks people mm-hmm. <laughs> uh kills mm-hmm. people uh and then eventually makes her way again she doesn't know why or how uh but she's driven to the home of the parents that birthed her right uh, and it's and, and then she eventually confronts her twin, who is you know the the total opposite of her, and so it's what happens during that encounter. And so you have again, kind of in, a, in classic horror narrative, this tension between the human side and the monster side of a particular individual. Mm-hmm. I mean, not near to the extent of a Jekyll and Hyde narrative, right? But but something mm-hmm. similar. Mm-hmm. Right, and. Uh you know, I, I think it was our last episode we talked about Otherworld and Barbara and the book having a, this kind of motif of, of doubling and, and mirroring and, and parallels. And um, reading this book, I was I was kind of I had, for some reason I had that in mind, and I was struck by how the kind of climax of this book is is essentially the, this hell baby character facing. Her, her mirror reflection this more kind of conventionally normal or human um, character and um, 
And so it's, it's a really interesting, you know, describing the book and, and even reading the book, it, it, it's very kind of pulpy and, and lurid and, yeah. and features these scenes of bloody horror. But, um, you know, you, it's something I, I, I didn't kind of connect until you were, you were, you were just saying that, describing that, that last scene where she encounters her twin. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a book that's, that's really rich in, in these themes that, that kind of gets at the heart of, of maybe the, the utility of, of the horror genre, the, the power of the horror genre in, in really interesting ways. Right. Um, you know, the parts of this book that struck me as, I don't know, do I want to use the word hokey? Um, mm-hmm. Maybe. Uh, are, are, are some of those events that you just wonder, okay, this is this is a plot device. This is something that just appears a little sensational. So, for instance, the fireballs, right? The mm-hmm. in, 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 We find out fairly early on in the world's graveyard that not long after this young girl dies, right, the one who was taken out mm-hmm. there uh, by the father, um, there's a series of fireballs that appear in this big disposal area, you know, the world's graveyard. Mm-hmm. And there's never an explanation for what those are, how they come about, what they're composed of, you know, what what's their, you know, their nature. But they have something to do with the mysteriousness of the world's graveyard and the reanimation of the baby, right? Mm-hmm. So at, at one point, a fireball consumes her, and that's how, in one way or another, she's brought back to life. And then about mm-hmm. halfway through, we have the fireballs appearing once again and this is when this is in the chapter appropriately titled the mysterious old woman where this mysterious woman uh, mm-hmm. appears and starts speaking to hell baby and says arise you worm that crawls the earth arise and listen to my words and she basically <laughs> says to hell baby that uh, she needs to go to the city uh, mm-hmm. And then she says, and then your revenge against the humans responsible for your fate shall begin, and you will find a chance to alter your destiny. Now go, follow your instincts. Your blood, your instincts will lead the way. Now, head for the city. Go to the city. Now, I was being overly <laughs> dramatic there, but, but that's the way that this scene is written. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, there are these melodramatic horror moments that – you know, again, may uh, approach the, the the hokey side, but you know it's okay. I think within the context of this of this story, uh, mm-hmm. a, again, it's a relatively straightforward, maybe even simple story, but but powerful nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's it's interesting that you hit upon those the those hokey moments, and I absolutely agree with you that that's a a pretty fair uh, description of those those scenes, uh, which are kind of integral to the narrative. But it's um, – reading this, I was it, – it kind of read to me very similarly to if you've ever read or got, got a chance to read earlier this year, Drone and Quarterly's um, collections of uh, Shigeru Mizuki's Kitaro series. Oh, yeah. I love the, Kitaro. His, yeah, his, his – That's epi- something kind of we need to discuss. It is, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. Um, but you know, to, reading this to me, it, it seemed very much of a kind of um, – the the same sort of tone at points, but it, it lacked the the humor elements of of Mizuki's work, and or it replaced the horror uh, the the humor elements with kind of more um, more I I want to say more horror elements, but that right. that seems like kind of a, a facile description. Um, but it did because in, in, in Kitaro there are those those weird kinds of of moments that that do read as, as very as very hokey or kind of artifacts from a a more lurid or, or pulpy kind of storytelling tradition. Um, but I, yeah, I absolutely agree with you about those scenes. But interestingly enough, I, I don't think that those scenes really detract from. Uh, the the effectiveness of those those more dynamic and energetic scenes. You know, I was watching um, I watched Wes Craven's original Last Stuff on the Left a couple weeks ago, and it'd been so long since I'd seen it, and I, I had forgotten that large parts of that movie are, are given over to these strange tonal shifts with these kind of Keystone Cop characters that 
it really detracts from the the horror aspect of that those that last thirty minutes or so. But here you have those these scenes that that are kind of weird and cheap and and strange, and they they seem kind of inconsistent with the other scenes in the book that are very fast and aggressive and expressive, but they don't, they don't degrade those, those other scenes. They don't degrade or, uh, come at the expense of the, those more kind of gory, physical, uh, visceral horror scenes, which I thought was, was interesting that, that, you know, was able to accomplish that. Right. And it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Mizuki's Kataro. I didn't even think until just now with you mentioning this that we could have included uh, a Kataro mm-hmm. book in this month's horror theme. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking at enough as it is. And we've had, as of this month, in fact, uh, two of these recent volumes published by Drawn and Quarterly. I know that there was a longer Kataro volume that came out in 2013, and, and, and I've read that. Uh, but mm-hmm. we've had two so far of the shorter collections of Kataro stories come out this year. But the difference, though, between Hell Baby and the Kataro stories is that the latter – is intended for a younger audience, or at least an, uh, mm-hmm. an all-age audience, right? So there is this this feel to it, something akin to, let's say, Astro Boy, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, adults can enjoy it, but it's it's really not threatening. It's not explicit, whereas Hell Baby is definitely explicit because you mm-hmm. have a lot of <laughs> severed limbs and gnawing of those severed limbs by Hell Baby. You have mm-hmm. dropping ma- maggots all over the place. Yeah, this is a very maggoty text. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of blood, and so this get, this can get rather explicit. This could give a kid nightmares if if he or she picked it up and read it, whereas Kataro wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I I, I don't think that. Uh... That uh, Hell Baby and Qatar are, are intended for the same <laughs> the same audience, um, but I, I was I was I was I, I kept thinking of Qatar, but also um, if you've ever seen the movie It's Alive, the Larry Cohen movie about the woman who gives birth to like a mutant baby, um, that's very similar to Hell Baby. Um, it's it's uh, yeah I, I I don't think I don't think. Uh, Hell Babies should be read by children. I don't. I don't want anybody to get that impression. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an explicit story. It's fun at the same time that it's horrific, and it ends nicely enough, at least for me, rather ambiguously. Although we do have those fireballs that mysteriously mm-hmm. just pop up again. They kind of end this, and in fact, the fireballs are neatly dispersed throughout this book, right? We see them in mm-hmm. the first part where they reanimate in some freakish way, Hell Baby. And then we see the fireballs around the middle, as I've mentioned, with the mysterious old woman. And then we see them mm-hmm. again at the end when Hell Baby returns to the world's graveyard after her encounters in the city. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, I like this. Uh, and and what, what, what are your thoughts on the art? It struck me that this art is much more reminiscent of manga from the 60s and 70s, some of which we've discussed in the past, than mm-hmm. definitely more recent stuff. Right. And uh, it's interesting that you asked me that because I was just about to ask you the same thing. Okay. Um, I was really taken with, with um, Hino's art. It's – like you described, it's it's – very unlike what we would see today, um, even stuff I would describe as kind of cheap stuff that that wouldn't really catch my interest that I, I wouldn't really describe as good, right? Because Hino's work is is like a lot of the work, like you said, the work of mangaka that was common from the fifties and sixties. It, it has this really flat quality to it, where the characters seem almost two dimensional. There doesn't seem to be this real attempt to make them uh, three dimensional in a lot of panels. And it gives it the a lot of those scenes where characters are, you know, it's pages given over to characters just screaming at, at um, increasingly loud volumes. Um, it, it gives scenes like that these, this weird affect that is is strange because I was I was thinking about Junji Ito's work earlier as well, and I, I think Junji Ito's work, the effectiveness of his work, comes from the fact that. It's so detailed. It has this naturalistic or, or realistic quality, 
where everything seems real and, and, and detailed. And so when you see these horrifying things, they're deeply affecting because we're seeing them done to bodies that seem very realistic. But Hino's work is able to affect that same level of kind of shock or, or horror um, or, or kind of visceral tactility to some of these scenes where Hellbaby is biting through an arm and ripping it off or, or chewing on it um, without rendering things with that level of detail, except for – and there's one – it's a double-page spread that's really notable where he draws almost like Richard Corbin. Um, where we first see Hellbaby and the, her skin has this weird texture and it's it's oh, very kind of l- yeah. l- lushly rendered and the skin has this, has this slick quality to it, but also a kind of grimy quality to it. But in in almost every other page, everything is, is very flat. It's very simple. It's very clean. Um, it's very, very heavily cartoon and very heavily stylized. But it's interesting that he is he is able to – with these figures that, that seem almost goofy kind of, right. he's able to pepper the book with you know, this melodrama and, and texturing the, the right things like that scene where you first see Helpy Boo or you know, the gore and that, that inky blackness of, the, of, of blood that kind of squirts out from these severed limbs <laughs> that, um, that gives this, the work this really effective experience expressive quality that I really, really appreciated that I found really unusual and almost unlike any other uh, cartoonist in horror or in any other genre I've seen that that style being used to to those kind of ends. Um, what did you what did you think about the work? Because it is, it is interesting art. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting in that uh, to come back to your comment about that two page spread where we first see Hell Baby being mm-hmm. Richard Corbin esque. Um, I didn't think of that, but now looking at it, I do see that its texturedness, especially contrasted to the art throughout the rest of the book, does strike me as something like we would find from from Corbett. You even have on this page, Shriek, Shriek. And there's a lot of shrieking in this book. That's basically Mm -hmm. all that Hell Baby does. The only way she communicates to us as readers is either through shrieks, which Mm -hmm. happens throughout, or in the, um, let's say, voiceover narration, which tells us the thoughts or the feelings of what Hell Baby is going through. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm with you on the flatness of the art, uh, and it's very cartoonish in places, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think to its benefit, and, and not cartoonish in the way that, say, the, you know, the, the Mizuki Kataro stories are, but um, cartoonish in that when you... When you introduce elements of horror to it, I think it makes it even more shocking or horrific just because of that Mm -hmm. uncomfortable juxtaposition, right? And and that was a Mm -hmm. keen observation you made. It's one thing when we see Ito's heightened realistic illustration display freakishness or or horrific situations. Um, It's horrific, but… You know, we kind of expect that. But when we see a more cartoonish art or a cartoony kind of style, as we see with Hino, and then we see the gore, then it's that disjointedness, right, in, in expectations, mm-hmm. that strange, uncomfortable juxtaposition between something that's supposed to look good, let's say, or cute, um, with the cartoonish art, and something that really disrupts us and makes us uncomfortable, the the mm-hmm. horror, the gore, and it's bringing those two together that makes Hell Baby so effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's it's interesting that you note that, and that's something that I, f- I read the first volume of, of Jason Shiga's Demon recently, and he has a similar kind of aesthetic that I, I when I wrote about it for the AV Club, I think two weeks ago now, um, I did I did mention something similar that. He has these moments of, of kind of visceral action and violence that is is oddly effective precisely because in other scenes and other panels, it's very kind of simple and flat and mundane and very cartoonish. And um, so I, I absolutely agree that Hino kind of – he uses that – what we expect from that kind of aesthetic to subvert those expectations in a really interesting way. Right. Did you listen to our interview with Shiga? By the way, from several. I weeks haven't. Ago. It is. I. I am. I am way behind on listening to podcasts, but I am. I always enjoy the interviews that uh, you guys do, so I am. I am keen to, to get a chance to sit down and, and listen to that. Mm. 
Yeah, check it out. We had a lot of fun talking with uh, Jason. But you're right. I hadn't thought about that connection. But what we have going on in Hino's work is very similar to what we have going on with Demon by Jason Shiga. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as you were making that Shiga connection, I turned to – I guess this is about – two-thirds of the way through Hell Baby. In a perfect scene here, this is the, I think, the second person that Hell Baby kills when she has made it to the city. You have a young boy doing homework or writing in, his, in a journal in his room, and he looks cute, right? I mean, this looks, you know, mm-hmm. big eyes, round head, and again, the cartoonish look, as I mentioned. And he hears something, and he doesn't know what it is. He asks, who, who, who's there? What? And, of course, we see this really kinetic uh, scene mm-hmm. where Hell Baby rushes into the window and then bites the kid on the neck. And, okay, it's one thing to bite the kid, but then on the next page, the kid's head pops or is ripped right off. And so here's this cute mm-hmm. kid, and all of a sudden he's beheaded. <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of a, a weird uh, result of – Working with a character, I think, that comes across as looking kind of cartoonish, that has mm-hmm. almost a bubble head, and his head's ripped off. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a weird it's a weird combination of of kind of subject matter and aesthetic. It's very strange, mm. um, but but I think I think you know, and why he knows work is so effective is that he understands that uh, that that aesthetic that that look very well and he kind of understands what people expect him to be able to do with it and he uh he kind of plays with those ideas in a really interesting way that yeah uh, I, I don't i don't know he knows work is it's 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 weird it's weird to talk about because it is it's so so strange looking in the context of of horror manga it's so inconsistent with with everything we see you know he's he's often compared to to Kazuya Umezu and Junji Ito cites him as a as an influence, but it looks just so unlike any of his antecedents and um, any of the people who kind of say that that they are inspired by his work or influenced by his work or or love his work. Um, it's it's just it's just a weird it's just a weird combination, but I mm-hmm. think I think it works really well, like particularly in that in that scene like you talked about where you're presented with this this figure that is it seems so kind of unassuming and innocuous and, and anodyne and then it's 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 a scene that's disrupted in the most kind of violent and visceral ways um much to my delight Well, you know, since you've already made this connection, let's use this opportunity to transition into the second title that we're going to be discussing this month, and that is Junji Ito's Fragments of Horror. Now, this was published through Viz Media in, I think it was Mm -hmm. 2014. And what Mm -hmm. we have here are eight short horror stories. Uh, The the titles are Futon, Wooden Spirit, Tomio, Red Turtleneck, which is one title, Gentle Goodbye, Dissection Chan, Blackbird, Magami Nakasuki, Whispering Woman, and those are the eight stories. Then there's an afterword by Ito. And, and I think that's a useful afterword because it does put certain things into context. In that afterword, Junji Ito tells us that this is the first time he has written horror, which is perhaps what he's best known for, in eight years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we have eight short stories, and so it's almost as if we have a story for each year he missed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that that afterward that note that it had been a pretty substantive length of time between his work in, in the horror genre was was interesting, and it is something I wanted to talk about. Do you think that that absence from 
working in this genre, the the effects of that are kind of evident in these works, or or how did you find these works? Do you think they're kind of on par with with his earlier work, like Uzumaki or Gyo or the Enigma, the Enigma of Amagara Fault, and, and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't think of them in those comparative terms because Uzumaki and Gyo, which you know, the latter of which I think was on our very first episode, manga episode we, mm-hmm. we discussed. Um, those are longer form works, so I expected mm-hmm. something different from those than I do from the stories here in Fragments of Horror. And because these were short stories, I I just didn't think of reading them in the same way. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, I did think that they were very freaky as, you know, his his other work (laughs) that I've read. And there's a lot that I haven't, right? And we should mention Mm -hmm. now that if uh, our listeners are fans of Junji Ito, as you and I are, then we're in Mm -hmm. for a treat in another month and a half because Viz is going to be publishing the complete deluxe edition of Tomi. Is it Tomi? Tomai? I think it's I think it's Tomi. Tomi, T O M I E, yeah. Yeah. And so this is a, a, I guess an earlier uh series of stories uh focused on the mm-hmm. character Tomi and it, it, it's mm-hmm. supposed to be classic. So I'm looking forward to that. But as we find in let's say Uzumaki and Gyo Strange situations, weird scenarios, and Mm -hmm. the first story is a great example of this. And this, I think, is the shortest of the stories in this collection. And basically what you have here is um, uh, a a young man, young woman, they're living together, right? And the young man, and we will see him later, I want to comment on that, uh, his name is Tomio. And he is on his futon wrapped up in a blanket, and he refuses to come out. And his girlfriend, uh, Madoka, keeps telling him, are you okay? You know What's going on? And he says he, he's afraid. He's seen things, and he wants to keep away from these weird spirits. And she has no clue what he's talking about. And there are various panels where we see things from his perspective. And it's classic – Junji Ito freakiness, and there's a, a two-page spread that gives us this glimpse from his perspective where he sees – it looks like a series of of almost cells uh, that kind of branch out like nerves mm-hmm. with, that, with faces on them and a witch or a witch-like character, a woman, naked woman. Uh, and mm-hmm. we're, actually, we're going to be talking quite a bit about naked women in this episode, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, but it's flying around. And so it, it's freaking the hell out of him, and, and understandably so, because it's a freakish scene. But that two-page spread is classic Ito. Um, but another thing that's classic about the Ito is is the weird situation, right? I mean, for instance, with Gyo, you wouldn't think that animals like sharks who make their way onto land and then attack humans – is a situation for horror, although it does become mm-hmm. that. Or with Uzumaki, right, the the spirals. What's so horrific mm-hmm. about spirals? Well, read Uzumaki and, and you'll see what's so frightening about, about spirals. So we have something mm-hmm. similar going on here, the the weird world inside of his blanket as Tomio is, is lying on his futon and refuses to come out. So, I mean, that's just a weird situation that, and I won't give away what happens at the very end of this story, but I think it's an interesting little twist that could possibly, mm-hmm. but maybe not necessarily, explain what Tomio is experiencing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting that you mentioned that that scene, that double page spread of kind of display of hallucinogenic horror being similar to the cells, and that is something that I think gets at the heart of, of what can, may be so affecting about Ito's work when it's when it is affecting and when it is, I think the work of his that is is really good is he has this way of, of drawing these, these kind of natural or unnatural things in, in ways, in structures, in forms that kind of um, mirror or match these natural phenomena or biological phenomena and almost make a mockery of those biological phenomena. Here you have, um, this these horrific kind of grotesque things mirroring the the shape and look of of kind of uh, of nerve endings um, or and later in the you have this kind of chimeric innards of this character in dissection Sean that kind of mirror the the organs of the human body and they kind of 
inverted, make a mockery of that. And mm-hmm. um, so I think that's an interesting thing to note that that I hadn't I hadn't realized that you're absolutely right that 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 image is kind of made to mirror um, the kind of dendrils of 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 spores, which is important to the kind of twist in that story or right. um, or nerve endings. Um, but that is something you see kind of throughout um, the this book in particular, but also throughout mm-hmm. Ito's work that I hadn't um, I hadn't noticed before. Right, and we can't underscore the significance of the grotesque as an ingredient mm-hmm. in the kind of horror we find in Junji Ito, because you cannot say that about, let's say, most of the other works that we're going to be discussing, uh, or they were discussing in this episode. Uh, but it is the grotesqueness of situation, it is the grotesqueness of image, it is the grotesqueness grotesqueness of the human face or the human anatomy that I think is what makes Ito's work so damn disturbing. Mm-hmm. That's it's interesting, and this book in particular, I, I would definitely say that that is absolutely a part and parcel of Ito's work, and what makes it so memorable. And it's the element of his work that I think has come to define his um, his career, particularly in America, uh, most prominently. Um, and it's it's most on display in this, but I think this gives me a perfect op- opportunity to talk about. What I really did not, what what really did not work for me about really any story in this book is, and I I really enjoy Ito's work, and I was really surprised to find myself disappointed with these stories. But they seem to only feature that grotesque element. They 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 lack, or seem to lack, the more thoughtful or compelling, um, or patient almost elements that that I really love about Ito's. Not just his long form storytelling, but some of the other short or shorter works of his that I've read, that ha- some of which have been translated in English, and, and some of which I've read kind of scanlations of. But those elements really seemed absent in these stories, and they seemed more to function as these kind of clever plots or scenarios that that emphasize these really the elements of Avita's work that. That almost make my make me want to rip my skin off. They make me so uncomfortable with my skin. They, <laughs> and you know that's that's present in in something like Go or the Enigma of Amagara Fault. I think most prominently and in Uzumaki as well. But it's married to this really palpable sense of dread. These really effective shocks. Um, this really thoughtful use of the horror genre to explore interesting ideas about. Um, about humanity and and madness and compulsion and things like that that really make me really work for me. But here he seems to only have the element of the kind of grotesque, and it just really they felt shallow and really superficial in that way. Um, and I just at a, at a certain point these works lacked the at the element of of Ito's that I like that make me enjoy reading his work and they only featured the elements that made me kind of uncomfortable and it it did make some of those stories just difficult to get through difficult to read and and difficult to think about um in ways that his other work the other work of his that i have read that i have enjoyed doesn't um and it's it's why i asked you how you thought it compared to some of his other work because in comparison, I, th- I thought it was a little disappointing. Did you did you feel similarly, or did you more or less kind of enjoy the the stories here, or some of the stories here? Oh, I enjoyed the stories, and, and some more than others. But I definitely see where you're coming from because you know, as you were explaining it just now, it struck me that the stories that I think you would agree are examples of the style that you didn't find as impressive are Dissection Chan and Magami Nanakuse. I mean, those are stories that, now that I think about it, just revel in the grotesqueness, and that's about all that they are. On the Mm -hmm. other hand, you get a story that I think is very different from not only those two, but I think almost anything else in this collection, and that is Gentle Goodbye. Uh, That, I think, is more... Well, well, first off, it's, it's... 
really not built on the grotesque as much as mm-hmm. the other stories. Mm-hmm. And there's more going on, much more going on in that story than just the impetus to creep out, right? Uh, and in fact, there's not much really creepy about about this it, it, compared to the other stories in this collection. Uh, mm-hmm. That gentle good, goodbye story struck me as a rather gentle story, very, very touching. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, what did you think of that? I mean, do you think that that is a standout story that works against what you were just ex- describing? No, I think that's, that's a good one to mention because you're right. It, it doesn't um, it doesn't feature the, the grotesque really in any, in any prominent way, shape, or form. And it does stand out from the other stories because of that. But at the same time, I do think that Gentle gentle Goodbye hinges on this this kind of self-satisfied almost uh, twist. It it felt very much like the way that that, that twists or twist endings in like an M. Night Shyamalan movie feel. Not, the problem isn't that there's this kind of abrupt um, abrupt shift in in the film, or twist in the film, or a revelation in in the film or story, but that the way it's presented, it feels so satisfied with itself, so kind of um, like it, the twist itself, the fact that it is a twist is enough to kind of satisfy the audience, but it's 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 really not, and it did feel to me the way that a lot of you know, there are a ton of really fantastic Twilight Zone episodes that I really love and enjoy. But there are three times as many that are, are just unbearable. They feature these twist endings that are so kind of non-events that um, it, it felt very much like that. It felt like this twist ending that was supposed to be so effective or surprising. And it, it just felt so flat to me. It felt... You know, it's it's not that I was I, I I rolled my eyes and obviously I saw that coming, um, but that when it happened and when that revelation occurs, it just was so unmoving to me that it it I didn't you know I I didn't really get anything out of it, and I think that has a lot to do with Ito's strong suit in horror is not that kind of horror, it's not that kind of storytelling, um, and so he's. And, and I, I absolutely admire his his willingness to to engage in, in elements of horror and other elements of dramatic storytelling that he doesn't ordinarily engage in and try new things and try to, to do interesting things with his, his storytelling, the stories he chooses to tell. But I don't think he is as capable of that kind of storytelling as he is in as other kinds of horror. And it wow. just it it felt it felt very flat to me in a way that that um you know it's just I, I I have very strong opinions about how I felt about this book. I can most tell most of them have to do with <laughs> most of them have to do with the fact that I was I was mostly just unmoved and I was surprised and disappointed because I I was really excited to read this and I really enjoy Ito's work and so most of that kind of those firm from opinions about this and feelings about this come from the fact that a lot of the stories just didn't really do much for me Hmm. um, in and of themselves. Well, let me say I I feel completely opposite uh, from you (laughs) on on the story Gentle Goodbye because Mm -hmm. that struck me as one of the strongest in the collection, definitely not flat. Now, Mm -hmm. we've been talking about the story. Let's just uh, go over the premise real quick. Basically, what you have, it, I mean, this is a story of a young woman by the name of Rico who has just recently married a young man who whose family is is named Takura, and it's a very strong, closely knit family. And when she um, begins living with the family, she discovers that the the extended family lives in the same house, and not just the parents and then some grandparents, but great grandparents great aunts and people who would seem to be too old to still be alive and at first Rico doesn't know what to make of this but then as the story progresses she or we through her um, realize that these older members of the family who seem to have kind of a haziness to them an opaqueness to them at times uh, are Mm -hmm. actually spirits or ghosts 
that have been brought mm-hmm. back from the dead, so to speak. And then Rico realizes and then talks with her, her young husband about this. He, he reveals uh, the truth about the family is that they have discovered that after the death of a family member, if everyone, all members of the family, the extended family, get together and pray and pray hard, then mm-hmm. you're they're able to bring back the spirit of the individual who had just died, and that they have that spirit for and I can't remember how many years it lasts, but there's a kind of an average lifespan, so does lifespan uh, for these ghosts. But mm-hmm. when they when the quote unquote life of the ghost is beginning to dissipate, that's when they become a little opaque, uh, more transparent and hazy. And so this is the premise that we have for this story. And I I don't want to give away the ending. I do think that it is a, I like the way you put it, kind of like a Twilight Zone-like twist to it. I think that this is the kind of story that would be successful in a Twilight Zone episode. So so I disagree Mm -hmm. with you on at least the effect it had on me. Um, mm-hmm. Very different from 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 you, and as I said, this is one of my favorites in the collection. Mm-hmm. No, and I'm, I, I I assumed we would uh, disagree about about some of these, and and I'm glad we did because you asking me about Gentle Goodbye and uh, about the other stories, it you know it gives me an opportunity to reconsider them, and and I did, I, I you know I paused for a second to reconsider um, Gentle Goodbye and, and kind of reassess what worked about it and what different, what didn't. And, um, so, you know, even if we disagree, I, I appreciate those opportunities to, mm-hmm. um, think, think more deeply about, uh, about why these stories didn't necessarily work for me. Oh yeah. So I, another one of my favorites in this collection was whispering woman. And I thought that that mm-hmm. was a strong story and, 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 a, and a good way to, to end this collection. Ones that just mm-hmm. didn't work for me as much, uh, or ones I've already mentioned dissection Chan, because that just seemed too damn wacky. Uh, that's mm-hmm. kind of like an over. I, I agree with you in that that is Ito going over the top with the kind of horror narrative and horror writing that he knows defines him. So he's just mm-hmm. playing that to the nth degree. And then the Megami Nanakusi, you know, the title character, the cross dressing title character is, uh, oh God, is just freaky. Uh, <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, the, I mean, that story has everything to do with behavioral tics. And again, that's mm-hmm. one of those weird situations, right? You wouldn't think that you could generate any kind of story from physical tics, much less a horrific one. But Ito attempts to do so. That struck me as another one where Ito's really playing up what best defines him. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think what's interesting about that story is... um it is you're you're right. It definitely is him hitting on of the things that he knows people are have come to expect from him, and they're the things, the elements of his work that get talked about most in criticism in conversations about his comics. But uh, again, that that story to me is is really disappointing because it it is something that it's an idea that he could have done so much more with. He could have made it as as compelling as, as horrific as as thoughtful and thought provoking as the kind of compulsion horror of something like the enigma of Amagara fault which I think is is my favorite of, of his short stories because he is able to so quickly and in such a small amount of of space affect such visceral horror and he does it with the same kind of tools and ideas as as um as that story and um so it's it's disappointing when you see him doing those things that you know he could have he could have taken these weird ideas these interest a tr- truly interesting idea about about taking the facial tics and bodily tics and turning that into kind of this body horror story the fact that he does so little with it is 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 just disappointing to me and it's it's how i felt largely about about these stories. Yeah. Um, but, now, I do agree with you on that, you know, Megami Nanakusi story. I, I do think mm-hmm. that that just wasn't the best Ito that we could have gotten. Now, mm-hmm. um, to contrast that, I did like the story Blackbird because I thought that image of the woman slash bird with the really mm-hmm. big lips that is constantly chewing and then depositing the meat in her mouth into someone else's. I mean, Okay, that is that's right up there with the freakiness and the horror of the spirals, 
it's just mm-hmm. creepy as hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think that and um, the Whispering Girl, the first last couple pages of Whispering Girl where um, – oh, is her name Mayumi or is that the name of the – the aide, I can't, I can't recall, but the girl comes home co- just dripping in blood with that, that dead eyed stare is, is, is really beautifully drawn and it's a really haunting, shocking image. And I think you're right in, um, in Blackbird, you have that just God, ungodly strange image of that bird, witch woman with those huge lips chewing. It is so unnerving and it is a kind of snapshot of what Ito does so very well but uh, again for me there's a lot of that throughout this book these really arresting images but the stories themselves seem to be kind of functioning around those images Um, they seem to be like Ito had the idea of this panel or this page or this idea for this, this creature and he kind of works the story up to that, you know, so that he gets an opportunity to draw that. Um, so for me, you're, you're absolutely right. There are some, some really freaky images and I, and, and characters and, and monsters in this book. But for me, their, their effectiveness is undercut in a big, bad way because they just seem like nothing more than freaky images. Okay. Well, let, yeah. let me ask you this. Uh, in before we move away from fragments of horror, what did you think mm-hmm. of the fact that in the first story, Futon, and the second, Tomio Red Turtleneck, we have basically the same characters, right? We have the young man Tomio and his girlfriend Madoka, who are mm-hmm. the central figures in each of these stories. And so that's the third and the third story in this collection. Did you make anything of this, or did the fact that you, he was reusing the same characters have any effect on you? Um, you know, that's, that's a really interesting question that I don't know if I can answer, because uh, to, com- to be completely honest, I didn't catch the names of the protagonists in the first story, and so I didn't pick up on the fact that it was the same characters in the red sweater. And so that's definitely something I, I would, I'd really like to reread both of those stories and, and think about a little more because it's, it's not something I, I caught and, and really had an opportunity to consider, but that's, that's really interesting. And, um, but you, you obviously picked up on it. Um, did you see, did you think there was a connection or did you, what did you make of that? Oh yeah. Well, there, there was definitely a connection because they're the same characters mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Yeah. what happens in, uh, Tomio red turtleneck is the fact that basically Tomio pisses off his girlfriend Madoka because he's attracted to the fortune teller that they visit. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there it, we get the sense in the second story that, you know, Tomio is someone who has an eye for the lady, so to speak, right? So he has a mm-hmm. girlfriend, but yet he's attracted to other women, and he'll follow those attractions. Uh, there's a little hint of that, though, in Futon, because the witch that is supposedly haunting him is not that dissimilar from the witch-slash-fortune-teller. It's not the same character, I don't think, uh, that we mm-hmm. find in the second story with the red turtleneck. Now, when I, when I read, let's say, the first three stories of this collection, so, you know, you have the first story, Futon, then the second one, Wooden Spirit, which we really haven't discussed that much. I mean, that's an okay story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the third one, Tomio Red Turtleneck. I noticed the name uh, Tomio and thought, huh, is that the same Tomio from Futon? And then, indeed, it was. We had the same girlfriend. And then I wondered, okay, is this just a collection of eight short stories or – are these going to be basically composing a story cycle? Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I've, I've done work on this in the past, um, both in comics and in more traditional literary studies, but I, I'm a big fan of and very much appreciate the short story cycle. Some people call it the composite novel. It's what I call in terms of comics the graphic cycle, right, where you mm-hmm. have individual stories that could easily stand on their own. But they're Mm -hmm. linked in such a way that taken together, they bring the entire collection 
to another level, right? So it, it's you know mm-hmm. it's the saying you know the the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So it's something similar going on, and I don't consider theme necessarily a good indicator of linkage between and among stories in a story cycle or a graphic cycle, but using the same characters or things set mm-hmm. in the same village or house or community or neighborhood definitely uh, would lean toward a graphic cycle. So I was wondering if what we have in Fragments of Horror may indeed be an example of a graphic cycle. So I was disappointed in finding no other linkages between any Mm -hmm. of the stories in this collection. Now, I have no problem with Ito using a couple of characters in only two stories and then letting that lie. Mm-hmm. But I was – since I'm a big fan of the story cycle or in comics what I call the graphic cycle, I was really wanting this to be something that it wasn't. So that's more of a problem for me. So when I saw that these characters are, are being used in two different stories, I, I really did want this to be a collection where the stories were all interlinked in a very intricate way um, mm-hmm. that may not even be easy to ferret out. But when I got to the end, <laughs> I thought, no, this is not a graphic cycle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I, I yeah I'll have to go back and reread those and and see what I make of those because that's a uh, that's in, that's interesting. But I I also would have it would have been interesting to see him link these stories um, more kind of fully or coherently. Um, I think that could have made for a, a radically different and uh, and possibly more more compelling or more interesting uh, and more cohesive. More work. This, right, it would have been interesting to see this as a. Uh, a kind of compo- like you said composite novel as a as a work that that is made of these kind of modular discrete parts but is also this um kind of meta unit of the single unit um that can be read as as a whole or as a as a collection of parts it uh, i wonder how that would have would have changed it would have even even identical stories just with you know minor superficial connections to to link them uh i wonder how that would have changed um how i how i read the story um, and it, it, it might have and for our listeners who aren't familiar with uh, the story cycle or in comics the graphic cycle i mean a great two great examples of that i think uh one is a classic uh will eisner's a contract with god which ironically mm-hmm. called itself a graphic novel but it's actually a series of four short stories, but those short stories mm-hmm. are all interconnected in a significant way. Definitely a graphic cycle. And then a more recent example of that is Frederick Bizan's Adam Sarlik. And this is something that Edward Govin and I discussed on, I think, our very first Euro Comics episode. That's a series of four or three shorter works that are interconnected in a very similar way, right? And so the linkage there is primarily through setting, but also character. And so it's something similar that we have going on with A Contract with God. Uh, but, but those are great examples of graphic cycles, and I had wanted Fragments of Horror to be another one, but it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although, uh, not to spend too much time on, on this book, um, there are some <laughs> thematic, um, or uh, not to be to hoity-toity, but there are some kind of semiotic relations between these stories. There's a kind of overarching fear of the female body that pervades. I think every one of these stories, the female body is one that seduces but also destroys. It is the kind of female body and female and a, desire. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the source of female sexuality, right. shall we say, to be yeah. succinct. Definitely, where um, wooden spirit comes into play. Yeah, is is um, but also dissection chan, um, mm-hmm. the the witch in the blackbird and um, uh, the uh, first story in the book whose name I'm blanking on. Futon. Um, yes, uh, and uh, you know, throughout, I think the only one that doesn't feature a, a woman using her sexuality to to destroy a man or to kind of project uh, this some sort of horror um, or to her body in the case of Dissection Chan um, is is the Whispering Girl. Um, uh, I think 
that's the only one that doesn't feature, you know, it's a, a woman's body being this this object of of, of horror. And, and it was interesting that, that Ito kind of keeps coming back to um, this idea that, that a woman's body is, is horrific, not even in, 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 in both inherent ways in the case of, of some of these witches, but also in in more augmented ways in the case of dissection, Sean, the, the horrific aspects of her body come from modification in um, Magami Nanosuke, uh, you know, the the horror of this woman's body comes from I don't know I have no idea what she does to her body but it, it's again some sort of augmentation and what story um, are you talking about um, Megami Nanasuke is that oh, okay, or am okay, I yes. I'm messing that up right that that final page reveal is I think the 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 central horrific kind of component of that story and that's a facial tick that's gone to an extreme right it's um. And uh, and so it is. It is worth noting. It is worth pointing out that that Ido does have these kinds of of meaningful bodily politics that he kind of keeps coming back to in in really big, obvious ways. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, these come out. I think in most of the stories, you're right, but not in all of them. You're and, and you pointed out that uh, the whispering woman. We really we really don't see this. Oh, and. The- and, and we the don't, gentle goodbye. Yeah, we don't see we was, don't see it there. I completely forgot yeah. about. It. You know, now earlier I mentioned that there are a lot of uh, naked female bodies in um, most of the texts that we're discussing, and one of those in the uh, that second story, the wooden spirit. I mean, here we have a woman <laughs> who gets naked and starts. How shall we put it? Let's just say making love to a house. Now, how right. is this? That's possible? like a real. Well, go, that's like a real story. Uh, of like a real fetish, though, from what I understand, people being sexually attracted to um, buildings and trying to uh, uh, with in, f- have have sexual congress of some sort um, with uh, with these these buildings and and homes and and massive spaces. It's uh, I couldn't recall the name of it, but I do believe that that is an actual thing. Although Ido hmm. does not, I don't think Ido relies heavily on. Uh, a realistic depiction of that thing. It is is more a, a fantastical. Um, I don't even know how to describe what happens in that story because it's not just that she is having sex with the building, but that the building is having sex with her. Yeah, <laughs> I guess is the most is the most accurate way to describe what is is occurring in that. Um, but oh man, the 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 so this the, gives the new meaning was... to making sure that uh, your home has a strong foundation. Right or a thick foundation, I'll say. <laughs> and I, oh man, that that story in particular is one that um, the the walls having eyes and the floors having eyes that really just made me uncomfortable in my own skin. <laughs> that image. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um but speaking of naked, hairy. It 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 does. It starts like becoming animate. Um. But uh, the ultimate. Um, message of that story is that uh, the Japanese government can re- revoke your status as a as like a historical landmark anytime if if your building falls into disrepair. So keep up with the with your home. Yeah. So the me- yeah the message of that story is <laughs> love your house literally. <laughs> But speaking of naked women, unless you had anything more you wanted to add about, um, Fragments of Horror, that's a perfect segue to Lychee Light Club. Um, okay, yeah, let's... Did uh, you, did, sure, yeah, let's discuss uh, Lychee Light Club. And this... I didn't know what to expect uh, in this mm-hmm. book. When I first came across it, I really didn't think from the cover that there that this was a horror title, although... The burning star in the background of the main character, Zira, 
should have been an indication that there's something almost satanic going on. Now, th- th- there, there's nothing really satanic or devil worshiping going on in this story. I, I think that the star, though, is just part of the symbol of the Lychee Light Club, this group of young boys that get together and, and they call their, their, you know, gathering their club, the Lychee Light Club, you know, after the fruit. Um, but yeah, this, I guess we could consider this definitely a horror manga. And one of the things that makes – I think there are – okay, there are two things that make it horrific, right, and perfect for this month's show. One is the fact that we have – I guess we could call it a robot, uh, a Frankenstein-type character that goes by the name of Lychee. And he's mm-hmm. called Lychee because, at least partly, he's fueled by the Lychee fruit. And without mm-hmm. that fruit, he doesn't have the energy to move. I mean he will freeze up. Um, mm-hmm. But um, he is a monster figure, again, like a Frankenstein. But to me, what makes this even more of a horror title is the behavior and personality of the character Zira. Mm-hmm. Right. It's interesting that you mentioned Frankenstein, and I think this character, this robotic character of Lychee, is, is like a Frankenstein. But like you, I... I didn't expect it to be horror when I, um, you know, first saw it, and, and even when I began reading it, and it it features. I think it is the the least horrific, or at least overtly horrific, um, of the books we're going to talk about today. But it's interesting that you mentioned Frankenstein because, for me, it does have that quality of she- Shelley's early Frankenstein, early um, science fiction, early horror. Um, that that used the kind of shocking the shock the shocking subject matter or you know what would be what was considered at the time um, well, well, I mean shocking but um, these these elements of, of of horror to kind of explore really interesting and, and complex ideas of what it means to be human and what it means to be humane. Um, and, and so there are elements of this story that harkens back to the very foundations of what we understand to be the horror genre today. Um, and I thought that was that was interesting that you that you mentioned it because it, it definitely gets at the heart of, of of both what Light to Light Club is about, but also the kind of tone it takes and, and the way it kind of depicts its, its subject matter is is um it's 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 classically. Perfect. Mm, yeah. Now, this was published – we haven't mentioned this yet. This was published by Vertical Comics in 2011, mm-hmm. but I think the original Japanese was published in 2006. And have you mm-hmm. read anything else by Usamaru Furuya? For, 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 uh, how do you pronounce that last I, name? For, 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 Furuya? For, 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 Furuya? Usamaru Furuya? Mm-hmm. Um, I have not – question mark. I <laughs> didn't think I had. I, I didn't think I had read anything by um, this cartoonist, but in the back of the edition of of Light to Light Club that I have, that I you know I assume it's the same vertical edition that you have, or anyone who's read it um, or has a copy will have. There's a an ad for another series that he did, an adaptation of a Japanese novel um, by Samu Dazai called No Longer Human right. that I. Th- I think I might have read the first or second volume of a number of years ago. Mm-hmm. I can't. I can't recall if it if it's if I'm thinking of this series or another series. But um, so I may have read one other thing that he has done, but I'm not super familiar with his work. Um, now, see, I have. He, he's got a two volume collection of stories called Shortcuts, and I mm-hmm. I have those, but I haven't. I didn't have the chance to to read them. I wanted to read them along with the other stuff that we're discussing this month. But then again, we had so many other things to discuss mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, normally in, in October. But um, but that's the only thing of his that I'm familiar with. And I did see The No Longer Human as well. But this is the first time I've read anything from Furuya. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's an interesting book. And one of the things that strikes me about this narrative – and, and okay, the, the premise is I think something that we've alluded to – Already, and we have a group of young boys who get together and they begin a club. 
um, that they eventually call the Lychee Light Club. And it gets its name Light because the original members, the founders of this club, uh, Tamiya, Dafu, and Kanida, if I guess you take their Japanese names and uh, the first letters, it spells out something similar to, I think, light in Japanese. <laughs> so they call it the Light Club and then eventually becomes the Lychee Light Club, especially with this Frankenstein-like uh, robot or creature, whatever you want to call it. And they make their headquarters in an abandoned warehouse of some sort or a factory. It's some place that I think adds to the horror tone that we get here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, 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 Think of it as representative of something like our Rust Belt, right? So this is where you know great things used to be manufactured, but it's now – Nothing. It's a shell of its former self or a ghost, if you want to say it this way, of its former mm. uh, purpose. And this is where the young boys go. And, and, and they go to a school that's not that well respected. And so this mm-hmm. is a way for them to find a sense, this 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 club uh, and gathering, it's a way for them to find some kind of sense of uh, purpose and to value their, themselves and also eventually to get revenge on the kind of people that they feel may look down on them, specifically young girls from other schools. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and that's basically the setup that we have here. And, and we have the leader by the name of Zira and then a variety of other people who are a part of the club. We've mentioned, you know, Tamiya, Defu, Kanida, but there's also uh, Nico, Rezo, uh, Dentaku, who seems to be the most scientifically oriented. Um, Jacob, and then a character that becomes extremely important as the story develops, Jabo. Now, it being the first time you and I are have apparently read, perhaps, uh, the work of Furura, let me ask you this. How did his art strike you? Um, yeah, that was an aspect of, of Light Shadow Club that I, I, I liked the most. I think it's you know, we mentioned earlier that it is kind of reminiscent of Suhiro Maruo, and um, in particular, the work of his that I've seen from his book that I believe is out of print now, Ultra Gash Inferno, which is this kind of the apex of his uh, eroguru, uh, erotic, grotesque, mm-hmm. nonsense style. And um, you see a lot of that. The way Furuya draws certain figures, his use of blacks. Um, you know, there's a number of panels where characters are kind of crouching and they're the, the cloth of their black school clothes kind of wrinkles around itself. And the way he draws that, that those wrinkles in the light hitting that black as these kind of streaks of white is really reminiscent of, of Moreau and even reminiscent of, of kind of contemporary Frank Miller comics. And um, so I, I really like the way he draw, draws a lot of things. I like his kinds of blurring of the masculine and the feminine, the way he draws certain characters with more effeminate features, um, more kind of precisely quaffed hair, uh, kind of clearly more well-groomed eyelashes and um, even painted fingernails and what appears to be nail polish. Um, uh, You know, I, I really like the way he, he draws a lot. Some of these characters faces, I, it was just kind of, Luke Warm on. Um, but there are a number of characters that I really like the way he draws. I really like the design of the costumes and I really like his use of that black. Um, but I also really liked his, the, the scenes where he draws from the perspective of Lychee, the robot as this kind of eight bit, very, <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of constructed out of these like, cubes almost these this these visible bits this low resolu- resolution right um and it makes for makes for like weird weird looking scenes but um i i, I thought I, I really appreciated those kind of pov little little scenes and sequences um mm. how did you how did you find uh Furia's yeah art it's, you know everything you said make, makes a, makes a lot of sense you're definitely right about the the way that he draws clothing folds uh, uniforms. I, I, I definitely appreciate the style. One of the things that threw me, and, and I'm not saying that I like this or I dislike this, uh, is his tendency, at least in this book, 
to mm -hmm. feminize, you said, many of the characters. I would say about all of the characters. Uh, and in mm -hmm. fact, when I first started reading this, it took me a while to realize that this was a club composed of young boys and not young girls. Because mm -hmm. the way that, that Ferrua draws the boys in the club. Now, you know, you mentioned the eyelashes and the, the hair, but also it is, you know, the, the fingernail, you, you mentioned that, like nail, it, it seems as if nail polish that they're wearing. And also it looks like they're mm -hmm. wearing lipstick and also lipstick. eye makeup because the eyes, the lips are accentuated in ways that mm -hmm. are almost indistinguishable from the women and the young girls in this, in this book. So it, mm -hmm. it took me a while to realize oh, um, these are boys <laughs> and, and, and not young girls. And also the poses that they assume mm -hmm. often have a more feminine feel to it than otherwise. The way that they hold their hands, the way that they touch their faces, the way that at times the characters cock their heads just strike me as ways that are more reminiscent of illustrations of women and female poses than mm -hmm. in anatomy than it is of the male body and the male pose. And again, I have mm -hmm. nothing wrong with it, you know, against that, but it just kind of threw me at first. So in this opening scene where we have, let's say, uh, an, an example of a naked body, and, you know, I'll just say it's quite a naked body, um, where a teacher, an adult female teacher, makes her way into the clutches of the, the Lychee Light Club, uh, she is investigating some young boy, she says, going into this abandoned warehouse, and she's caught, and the boys think that she's a spy or she's there to do them wrong or something. And so, I mean, it becomes really erotic. Um, mm -hmm. They they handcuff her, they, they tie her, bind her to uh, a surface, and, you know, accuse her of, of snooping around and then they strip her and they tear her clothes off. So when I saw this scene, not really certain yet of the gender of the people in the light club, I thought, okay. <laughs> because there's this scene where they, they rip off the clothing of this young teacher. And again, mm -hmm. this is quite a striking uh, young woman, uh, this teacher. And the character Zira begins to fondle her from behind and i'm thinking mm -hmm. okay this is uh this is becoming really interesting and and then we have close up of this teacher's body part i think this is the most mm -hmm. sexual that this story gets it doesn't bother me mm -hmm. at all but it just strikes me as interesting given some of the other things that we're discussing this month uh there're mm -hmm. many times of a of a part but mm -hmm. um yeah it's that art and the the feminizing of the young boys in the story that I find curious because this he maintains this throughout the story. So as mm -hmm. things continue, it's not as if the boys in the book and or in the club look more masculine. Uh no, even mm -hmm. what happens at the end, by the end, I mean, they do have a very feminine look. Uh, again, nothing wrong with that, but the way that they're drawn seems to be suggestive of the way that women are drawn and posed more than men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned two things that um, I, I'm, you know, I'm glad you did because of their things about this book that in particular that I wanted to talk about. I think first and is this idea that he draws more feminine men, and it's it's an interesting idea and you're, you're absolutely right. The way he draws these characters is very it's it, – they're coded as feminine. And I, I haven't really had the time to sit down and because and, I had so much to read this week and, and for other things. And I've only had this book for you know three, four or five days. Um, so I haven't really gotten to devote the, the thought and uh, the time that I'd really like to to this idea. But it is interesting that Freya has these characters that are, are feminine and they're performing this kind of femininity – and we don't really see any adult men. Even the, the boys we see are we, – we, we find out they're 13 years old. They're prepubescent. They kind of embody this pre-masculine, what, what Carol Clover describes in, in Men, Women, and Chainsaw as pre-masculine um, uh, modes. And, um, and that allows them to access these kinds of – you know, in, in Men, Women, and Chainsaw, she talks about in, in movies like Poltergeist, these younger 
kids, uh, even though they're boys, are able to – they are a party to the same horrors that are usually reserved for um, for women, for girls. And because they're, they're not yet adult men, they're not yet men, they are in this state that kind of um, precedes masculinity that allows them access to – the, the realm of femininity. And so it's interesting that Fruya has these characters who are, are not yet men, who are not yet boys. And when they, and we have a character at the very end who reveals that as they are approaching puberty, they are getting further and further away from this aesthetic ideal of beauty. And they describe that they're, right. they're getting further away from it because their features are getting more masculine. They are growing facial hair and yeah. they're getting more muscular and so he constructs this ideal of beauty that is very uh, – it's, it's coded as, as feminine. And, and so like I said, I haven't had the time to really think yeah. about this idea. But it is interesting that he – this book is about it, – it is largely about, about gender and uh, about gendering a, a beauty ideal and, um, and about the sexuality of these young boys because not only are they – they're prepubescent and they're very effeminate and – and feminine, but they are also um, uh, gay. They're gay characters who are um, tacitly in love with one another, explicitly in love with one another. They're engaged in um, not just romantic relationships or romantic entanglements, but also sexual relationships. Um, and they are, are they grow jealous of one another um, because of those sexual relationships. And so he is playing with sexuality and and the the kind of boundary of, of heterosexuality and homosexuality, but also the, these, these kind of gender boundaries. And, um, and so I think that's, that's really interesting. And it's an aspect of this work that, that really struck me. And it's something I'd, I'd really like to devote more, um, more thought to, but, um, see, that's interesting. I think you're seeing more in this than I see now, definitely by the end of this story. And this involves, this revelation, and we don't want to give anything away, no spoilers here, uh, a, a character that we mentioned previously, Jabo, uh, he becomes very important at the very end. And this is where much of what you said, I think, really comes to the fore, that mm -hmm. much of this book, I don't, I don't think the entire thing, but much of this book is about gender and how we see ourselves and coming of age in such a way that when these young boys are young, prepubescent, they look a certain way, and it is this aging that begins to make them look more masculine, and that's what, you know, at least Jabo is rebelling against in certain unique ways. And so that's when this comes to the fore. But if you take that part, and this occurs at the very end, but if you take that revelation out mm -hmm. of the formula, then... It, I don't really think that message or theme is apparent throughout much, if any, uh, of the text. Now, now you mentioned the, the characters being gay. I didn't really come away with that. You know, first and foremost, I think because you know this, we're dealing with you know prepubescent boys here. Yeah, so it, it's not as if this is manifesting itself in terms of sexual desire or attraction in that way. The people definitely are drawn to the character Zira, but the way that the narrative. Uh, unfolds, I thought that they were drawn to him just because uh, just the magnitude, uh, his, his allure. Mm -hmm. In other words, I was thinking it's something akin to the allure that Hitler would have, right, to people around mm -hmm. him. And, and, and I say that not lightly, but because the uniforms that they wear strike me as quite fascistic. Uh, and mm -hmm. their behavior, especially what uh, Zira demands of them. I, I saw this as more of a book about power than I did about gender and sexuality. And, and I know that those can go hand in hand, but I definitely mm -hmm. thought that the power element uh, was there. Now, there is a not-so-pre-pubescent, uh, definitely a post-pubescent thing going on between Zira and Jabo. And, and I think that's where that sexual attraction and male-male desire really plays itself out in this story, even early on. But with the other characters of the way that Rezo or Nico feel about Zira, I think that they're just, you know, taken by the guy. You know, they, they find him mm -hmm. attractive in terms of the power that he wields uh, because he does 
but we do find out that Zira assumes the power that he does because he feels that he's destined, right? There's something that happens mm-hmm. with him where an old man says something to him and he feels, oh, you know, I'm destined to do whatever it is that I'm going to be doing that will include power. Uh, and apparently, mm-hmm. uh, you know, wearing Nazi-esque uniforms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That it's, That's a reading of it I hadn't, I hadn't picked up on. I, I absolutely think you're, you're right that these uniforms are – they do recall that that fascistic aesthetic, and I think they are. Maybe I would guess that they are specifically designed to kind of evoke that, especially since um, you know Hitler is mentioned several times explicitly mm-hmm. and compared to this character of Zero. Um, but that that foregrounding of of power as this central dynamic in the book is I, I can absolutely see where you're coming from, and it's a, it's a reading I didn't pick up on. Um, but uh, I would be be interested to go back and reread that with that in mind. You know, my my reading of horror in particular is informed by um, by texts like Men, Women, and Chainsaw and um, the masculine or the monstrous feminine um, books uh, about kind of gender and sexuality in in horror and um, and because horror is is often very rich in those kinds of ideas and mm-hmm. and uh, it's very easy to read horror films and horror comics and, and horror novels um, with those in mind. And so I'm, I have this kind of predisposition to uh, to look for and pick up on those things, which would explain my my uh, my priority, my prioritization of of some of those elements that um, that you may not have, have paid my, as much mind to. But, it, it you know, it kind of blinded me to uh, another um, another reading that uh, now that you mention it, I, I see it. I see it pretty, pretty clearly. Um but it is. I was. I was really surprised by by just how by just how rich this book was because it it, it does it does provide ample um, material to to work with for for either reading and for I'm sure other readings as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's shift gears a bit and move on to the fourth book that we're discussing this month, and that is June Abe's Portis. This is published mm-hmm. through Viz Media, and they came out with the edition in 2007, but I believe the original Japanese was published in 2006. And mm-hmm. this is the first time I've read anything by June Abe. Uh, you as well? Uh, yeah, I had never heard of this book um, at all, but you uh, mentioned it as wanting to do it for this show, and you know I'm kind of up for anything for uh, for this show, so uh, I just figured let's let's do it, let's go ahead and let's uh, get into it. And uh, you know I read it, and I try to try to read a little bit more about about Junabe and about this book, but there doesn't seem to be much on him or on his work available in English, so I really know next to nothing, even after reading this about. Uh, about him or about uh, what other kinds of things he's he's published mm-hmm. but um you're the one who who suggested it so I would be interested to know how uh, how you managed to come across this book well again I was doing in preparation for this show so I guess about a month or two ago uh, just doing some search on you know horror manga and not necessarily recent stuff but but this title came up in a couple of searches and I read the premise and I thought perfect because what I read strikes me as one of the best premises for a show on horror, Portis. Mm -hmm. And basically what you have in Portis is it's based on a video game called Portis that is rather legendary in that people who have played it, not everyone, but many people who have played it, uh, eventually die through mysterious means. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about this video game that lures people in, so to speak, and they end up dead. And so that mm-hmm. had the, poten- the potential to be extremely creepy. And then when I got my copy of this book, I started to leave through it, and I swear there's some scenes in this book that are as creepy, if not creepier, than the creepiest stuff that Junji Ito 
has written. And again, it comes to you know back to the game element, and especially when we have these childlike faces appear in certain ways uh, that are associated with this game. Uh, it 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 is chilling. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know after reading it if the creepy factor was everything that I expected it to be, but especially the first half of this book was quite frightening and creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That um, it's the face of the the Kokeshi, I think it is that that giant rounded childlike face. Is uh, is absolutely uh, an unnerving image. Mm-hmm. And, um, and a kokeshi is it's something like a, a little wooden, almost. How would you describe this? Because um, um, they describe oh, it in, in an editor's note, I guess, at, at some point in the book, what a kokeshi is, and it's it's something mm-hmm. not really. It, a clothespin, but it's about that size, kind of a larger clothespin, wooden, and it has. It's like a pen. The body is like a a dowel, right? Uh, And then there's a head that goes on top of it. And the kokeshi is supposed to be a little wooden representation of a human, Mm -hmm. one who has has died. And it's a way to, um, if not necessarily honor the spirit, then at least to recognize uh, the passing of that individual. It's a way of dealing with the fact that uh, that uh, someone has died. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, the, so I think that's where some of the creepiness came in. But but it's even beyond the Kokeshi that I noticed some creepiness because when we first see one of the, the early characters in this story, and this is someone, uh, Chiharu, who ends up dying fairly early on, so this is no spoiler, um, sometimes in the background... Of a, of a scene with her, you will see a ghostly face of a young boy. And, you know, this, this, this is associated with the Kokeshi, but it's not noticeably the Kokeshi. Basically, mm-hmm. have, what we have as a premise here is that uh, a, a young female student by the name of Asami Kawakami, Kawakami, I'm sorry, uh, Asami Kawakami, is worried about a friend of hers, uh, Chiharu, whom she hasn't heard from in several days. Last she heard, uh, Chiharu was playing a video game. And so Asami is talking with a teacher of hers, Keigo Sawa, uh, our teacher, about how she's worried about her friend. And Mm -hmm. then not long after that, Chiharu comes back to school, and Asami is glad to finally see her, saying what happened, yada, yada, yada. Uh, And then... Chiharu goes back home because something is bothering her. She goes back home, and before we know it, she's dead. But she's dead in front of her video game. Uh, And it looks like it is a suicide, that she slit her own throat, which is, you Mm -hmm. know, I mean, what a way to go in terms of a suicide. So Asami is suspicious and is wondering what really happened to her friend Chiharu. And then she notices the game, and then the story goes from there. Uh, the teacher, the male teacher, art teacher, uh, Kaigo, does some research and finds out that you know there is an, a legend, an eerie legend behind this game. And so he begins to investigate. Then another teacher uh, of theirs, a woman by the name of Miyami uh, Yamasita, becomes involved because an old boyfriend of hers – had been playing that game and ended up dead. So she's suspicious. And so all of these characters are drawn into this weird world that has something to do with the video game Portis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting premise, but I, 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 um, I think it was less effective on me. And I, I don't want to pin this on Jun Abe, and I was I hesitate to use the word derivative because I don't really get the sense that he's he's drawing on a lot of these things. But to me, uh, Portis's kind of effectiveness as a vehicle for horror and shock and suspense was really undercut by the fact that it was just so reminiscent of so many things. I mean, the um, the the central premise is identical to the premise of um, a really unwatchably bad horror movie I went and saw with a bunch of friends when I was like 
12 that really freaked me out at the time but now i realize it's, it's completely garbage um about a you know a video game you play that you know if you you know you it, it can kill you um and then a lot of you know aesthetically and a lot of the scenes particularly the scenes at the very end where they kind of attempt to resolve um this haunted video game and um kind of quell these restless spirits is is I really similar to like Silent Hill, like the early Silent Hill games from the late nineties or the early Resident Evil games. Um, and so for me, I was just, and, and I, again, I don't want to put this on the work because it's, it's more to do with my kind of history with the horror genre and the, the things I've engaged with previously that I'm, that I'm bringing to it that really kept me from engaging with it in a, in a, in, a, in a direct and visceral way, I was always kept put in. I was always being put in mind of other things that I think are more successful at the things that that Portis is, is trying to achieve. But um, you seem to to respond differently to it. You, uh, I, I believe, really really enjoyed this book, right? Well, I did, especially the first half of it. And, and again, in terms of the creepy factor uh, that that initially drew me in, I, I was more satisfied with the first half than the second and the way it plays out. Because what we learn, and again, we're not going to give anything away, but that part of what's going on with this game, where there is a hidden stage that may that a player may accidentally come across through through any number of ways, uh, but that this stage of the game that draws people in and eventually becomes their demise uh, is linked to a tragedy outside of the game in the real world that Mm -hmm. the developer of the game, or at least uh, the developer along with his brother, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Satoshi Sugano and his younger brother, uh, kind of built into the game. So they're linking what happened in the real world with what the programming of the game is all about. Um, I, I didn't find that last half of the book as as satisfying in terms of the way that Abe was tying these two things together, the game world and what actually happened more historically. Um, I think it worked well enough. Uh, it just mm-hmm. didn't impress me as much as, as the first half of the book. But mm-hmm. um, I do think that the protagonist of this story, uh, the young Asami, was a, a compelling character. Although I, you know, I'll mention here that even though we don't see her naked uh, as we do with a lot of other women in the books that we're discussing this this month, um, there are scenes that are rather erotic with this young girl, and, and that's where the disturbing element comes in. I mean, mm-hmm. we see her in what looks like a nightgown, bound uh, two mm-hmm. or three times. Uh, there are occasions where adult men appear to at least beginning or trying to to rape her. Uh, but I, but I don't think that Abe represents this in a problematic way. Um, mm-hmm. I don't I don't think it's gratuitous. In other words, mm-hmm. yeah, I definitely think I definitely agree with you that the, that I think the first half is is more successful than the the back half, and that Abe is he does a good job of kind of creating this very creepy, eerie um, atmosphere um, that I, I don't know if he totally sticks landing. Um, but I, I agree that there is. And it hits upon something that I actually f- intended to and forgot to talk about with our last book, um, which is much – it's much more um, prominent in, in Light Chi Light Club than it is here. Um, but with with a lot of Japanese horror with like you know, uh, Light Chi Light Club and, and the work of Sahiro Mar- Sahiro Maruo and um, – and even Junji Ito, there is, you know, it's working in this kind of this genre that I mentioned um, previously, uh, the ero guru nonsensu, the erotic, grotesque, mm-hmm. and, and nonsensical, which is this this genre that that comes out of the the 30s and 40s, and it it, it um, you know has its its roots in in uh, ukiyo e like woodcut paintings, like Dreams of the Fisherman's Wife, where the 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 woman is, um, which I think is by Hokusai. Um, where the woman is is having sex with with the octopus that I'm sure people listening to this maybe if they don't the, the name doesn't put it in their mind they've almost certainly seen this image but it's this this genre or subgenre or kind of idiom um, that uh, where the there's this kind of confluence of of the erotic and the grotesque and it, they overlap and and one kind of feeds the other and um, it, it makes 
for very problematic sexual politics for obvious reasons because it, it does there's a prominent element of sexual violence and it's mostly sexual violence committed by men against women right um but um you're right i think there is an a, a very slight element of that in just one or two scenes where you see um a character in her like bra and panties but it's it's not as explicit or as violent as it's it's not even comparable to, to what we see in in something like Lychee Light Club, even which which really only features it in a couple scenes. Right. Um. But there is definitely that. Element this it hints here at Iru- very briefly. It hints at Iraguro. Right. It's the kind of like um. It's um. I'm trying to think of a good comparison. Um. But I am I am failing. It's it's like it's like the milder form, shall mm-hmm. we say, where it kind of. There is that. There is that kind of combination of of the horrific, the grotesque, the violent, uh, and and the kind of erotic, um, or intended to be erotic, but it's it's very it's very brief and it's it's very um, Fleet, fleeting. Right. It's it's the sexuality is is almost chaste by comparison, and the violence is very tame by comparison to what you you see in something like. So here, Maru, even, you know, we talked about um, Panorama Island on the show, and that is a work that, that again, features those eroguro elements, but even that is, is, is mild compared to his other work, like I've mentioned a couple times on the show already, Ultra Gash Inferno, exactly. which takes that, that, um, that collapsing of, of the erotic and the, 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 grot- the, the erotic and the, the violent into one thing. Right, it's the difference to, to an incredible extreme. Right, what you're describing, it seems to me, is the difference between seeing the naked form and then seeing the clothed form with just a hint of the contour. Well, it's more like um, seeing like a like a Victoria's Secret commercial, which is is what I would describe like um, Portis as, or that one, <laughs> even just that one brief scene in Portis. To like Sahira Maru, some of his work, um, or or some of the like films you can see the uh, the Eroguru or like Pinku Aika films, um, you can see is like the most hardcore, gross gross out porn you can find on the internet. Mm-hmm. By comparison, um, you know there's that there's in one there's an obvious element of like sex and sexuality, but in the other it's taken to such a horrifying extreme that it's like. You can't even stand to, to look at it for more than a few seconds. Right. Um, but um, but but yeah, Portis is, and I think that's I think that is true of of Portis as a whole. It is it is kind of tame, except for a few brief instances of pretty graphic violence towards the end. It's pretty tame by comparison to some of the other things that we have we've talked about on the show and talked about in, in other episodes of the show. Um, you know, it's it's not as 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 violent or as or as graphically violent or as gory as um, as even I would say Hell Baby. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Now listen, your drag is my skull and bone pack. There's a mean old monster down from Las Vegas track. He's flipped his lid, hangs in a cave, and sleeps in a coffin, your Dracula's grave. He's mean, ornery, mad, and rough. Always misbehaves and dips chocolate snuff. Don't meddle with this, cuz he do forget it. Just hop in your woody and split, man, split it. He's the beast of Sunset Strip. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Um, let's now we're, we're coming into the home stretch, so yep. we're going to be looking at two very recent books that have uh, just come out, uh, both of which are published by Kadansha Comics. And then the first title that we're going to discuss of the two is The Black Museum, The Ghost and the Lady, Book One, and this is mm-hmm. by Kuzuhiro Fujita. And it, again, it came out, I think, just this month, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that and the next book we're going to talk about, I think, are brand new. Yes. So this has an interesting premise. Now, l- before we get to the premise, let's start by the title. 
because as you and I were going back and forth with some of the people that we were communicating with at Kadansha, and, and we should mention a big thank you to both Molly and Benjamin because they have been – uh, extremely generous and helpful in helping us to get not only these books, but also other Kadansha books, uh, some that we've discussed on past episodes. And, and that does really go a long way, that the help of publishers, especially publicity departments, uh, helps to make what we're doing on this podcast possible. But when we were communicating with Molly about the Black Museum, the Ghost and the Lady Book One, at times I think she was referring to referring to the book as the Ghost and the Lady – and then at other times, I think it was referred to as the Black Museum. Now, from what I'm gathering, the overall series title is the Black Museum. And then this first, I guess we could call it a narrative arc. That's that's what I gather is going to be mm-hmm. call, is called the Ghost and the Lady. And so this is the first volume. Book two of the Ghost and the Lady will come out, I think, in December, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it's not that far um, away, but. And so I'm wondering if there's going to be other narrative arcs of the Black Museum series. So the Black Museum and then another subtitle, book one, book two, and then maybe book three. Uh, that That's the sense that I get because this is brand new to me. I hadn't heard of it before they suggested it at Kadansha, and I've never read anything by Fujita before. Uh, yeah, this is the first I've I've heard of um, them as well. Uh, I have, I have no clue what uh, what other work they've published, and uh, this is my my first hearing when when we both first first heard about this from Kodansha. Yeah, um, that was the first time I'd heard about this series at all. Yeah. So. so the premise of this story is, is interesting. At the very beginning, we get what becomes the narrative frame of what we're about to read. Uh, there is a museum or archive of some sort, um, and it, it's called the Black Museum. And is it part of what Scotland Yard? I guess. Uh, yeah, I believe it's supposed to be um, part of or or connected to Scotland, right. Scotland Yard. Yeah, right. And this is where various um, items are kept. That have something to do with strange cases, unusual cases, maybe unsolved cases. And as we begin the book, uh, an older guy is coming to the museum and speaks with a young woman who's the curator. I don't even know if we get her name, but but she's the curator of the Black Museum. And he wants to talk with her about something. He sits down in a chair, and it's almost as if he falls into a trance. And then out of him emanates this spirit, right? The man in gray. And the man in gray is this ghost-like figure that begins telling the story to the curator about his relationship with Florence Nightingale. Thus, Mm -hmm. the subtitle of this first book, The Ghost and the Lady. And so that's what... Uh, we have in this first book from the Black Museum series is what's happening. How did, how did the man in gray, who goes by the name of Gray, uh, comes to meet Florence Nightingale, this actual historical figure, why this meeting is significant, and what it has to do with the theater. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, because Gray meets Florence in the theater. And they take on a strange relationship in that Florence wants the man in gray to kill her Mm -hmm. because she's unhappy and she feels like she's about to fall into despair. And gray, who loves theater, in fact, he haunts, uh, you know, a a famous London theater, the famous London theater and – wants to uh, on Drury Lane and wants to make this a performance and so he's really into it right and he has to, he wants her to wait until she's in her deepest despair in order to kill her to make it much more dramatic and so throughout this first book that's what he's waiting for her to do is to fall into a state of despair that is so low that he can actually take her life mm-hmm. which is a little weird yeah, it's um, it is it is it's it's an unusual premise, and I'm having a hard time. Oh, uh, it's when I was reading, it, I was really struck by how similar the premise was to a couple other things, but I'm having a hard time 
remembering where exactly I've seen something like this before. Mm. Um, now, let me mention another uh, another important part of this story is the fact that there are. I don't know what you call them. Uh, I mean, their names are Eidolons. They're called Eidolons that inhabit all humans that are only visible to other Eidolons and also, I guess, spirits, right? Ghosts like the man in gray. Mm-hmm. And, but also they're visible to Florence. And these are f- these monster-like forces that kind of feed off human angst and anger and that attack other people's Eidolons. But what's so weird, at least for the man in gray, is that Florence's Eidolon is attacking her, which is the mm-hmm. first thing, which is unusual, right? Eidolon, a person's Eidolon, this, this weird monster-like force, doesn't attack its own host. But this is what happens with Florence Nightingale, and that's uh, initially what draws the man in gray to Florence and what she's all about, because he wants to find out you know, what makes her so different uh, in terms of a relationship with her Eidolon. And so that becomes kind of freaky, uh, the whole Eidolon thing throughout this story. And at times, the way that uh, Fujita draws the Eidolon, it, it makes it, at times, difficult to figure out the action because everything is so kinetic in the movement and the fighting and, and the violence of uh, mm-hmm. the Eidolons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't really have a ton to say about this series. I wasn't really won over by its premise, and its execution wasn't – it didn't really grip me. Um, but I will say that um, you, you mentioned that some of this some of this art, especially the scenes with the, the Eidolon, and as I was, I was looking through the, um, the book as you were speaking, and you know, that, that, that page where the Eidolon kind of like – Whirls down his blade and it's, it's coming to to dig into um, to Florence Nightingale's chest. You know, there's there's a number of scenes and panels like that throughout the book, and um, I did really really like that about the book. You know, mm-hmm. I, like I said, I wasn't on the whole, I wasn't you know too. I don't really have many opinions about it, but I did really like um, all, certain details of panels, the way he draws the eidolons, the that that dynamism, that energy he gives it, where it's this almost incoherent whirl of movement. Um, other images where the the, the man in gray first appears, um, maybe not first appears. I think first appears to Florence, um, where he comes out of the floor as this kind of like swirling kind of body of 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 mass that's that's wrapped itself kind of it's like twisting around itself. Um, and it looks like I'm trying to find it here so I can better describe it, but it looks almost like it's, it's uninked, like it's, um, drawn with, okay. So it's like the second page is when he first appears where he's this kind of phantasmic, very creepy looking spectral figure with long nails and the kind of exterior of his body, the silhouette of his body looks like it's been inked with a thin, very thin line, but the rest of his body is so kind of finely hatched um that it, it it appears to take on this gray that you get from like the graphite of a pencil and it it gives it this very weird aesthetic this very weird texture um that that juxtaposed to the other figures not just in the way it's detailed but also the way it's rendered um it feels otherworldly it appears otherworldly in this really immediate intuitive um way and uh the book is full of of little details little images little uh bits of panels or panels that are are really really terrifically drawn really beautifully drawn but i I didn't find that to be the case consistently i thought for the most part um you know the the um uh, what is i cannot remember this person's name um even though uh fujita the fujita affects this aesthetic that is um, it's much more kind of conventionally shonen. It's like a, it has the kind of same look as as other popular shonen manga, and mm-hmm. um, it, that didn't really work for me. But I did really appreciate the opportunity to read the book because it does feature uh, 
every so often you get those those panels or those details where something or someone or some object is so beautifully drawn and so compellingly drawn um, that it, it totally makes reading the book uh, worth it. And I'm glad I got the opportunity, even though I didn't, I wasn't really head over heels for it. Yeah. No, um, you know, I, yeah, you did point out the, the way that the art is used to distinguish between, let's say, the human world and the world that is beyond the perception of most humans, right? The spirit world, mm-hmm. the world of the, the Eidolons. Uh, and, and there is, I think, for the most part, uh, a distinction in terms of the art between one and the other. And I do appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that that this is a book or a manga about storytelling, or at least it's based on storytelling, because, I mean, mm-hmm. you, do, you do have this frame narrative. And I can't remember if every chapter begins this way, but the vast majority of them do. Um, back in the primary narrative level where Gray is telling his story to the curator and basically setting up what is about to take place in the chapter to follow. So every now and again, we're we're brought back to the initial ground-level narrative. Then we're propelled back into this world of Gray's relationship with Florence Nightingale. Now, an, mm. another thing worth noting about this, you know, we've been talking about the occurrence of, if not, you know, the erotic in the grotesque, the Eurogoto, but maybe just naked bodies of women. And I did not expect to see Florence Nightingale naked, but <laughs> she's naked in a lot of this first book. Um, I don't, I didn't really get the necessity of making her naked. At first, I thought, well, maybe this is the way that the Eidolons or the spirit world, if we want to call it that, see her. But that's definitely not the case because more times than not, she's clothed. And, you know, when she is clothed, I mean, she looks like the typical Victorian, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But yet there are those scenes where usually when she's attacked by an Eidolon, either her own or someone else's, where she she appears completely naked. And, you know, I I never thought of Florence Nightingale as stacked like that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, I mean, that that's the way that Fujita is, is drawing her, and it just struck me as a little unusual. I, I, I couldn't figure out the reasons for drawing her naked in places, but yet she's naked often. Yeah, I have um, – I don't know what's going on with that. It seems to me <laughs> to be bizarre and, and, and gratuitous. It doesn't – like, you're, you're, you're right. It would be one thing if, if, you know, all of the men we see as we see their kind of Eidolons – um, if they were naked, maybe too. Um, but the only character who seems to be naked is Florence in these scenes where she's being attacked by her Eidolon. And it's there doesn't seem to be any real purpose for it um, beyond to kind of ogle at. And it's, it's not even the kind of like anime nudity you sometimes see where, um, you know, you, you see a naked – you see the naked form, but it, it's, you know, doesn't have nipples or it doesn't have um, – a vagina, right? There's no um, hint of 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 any any genitalia, but you see the kind of you know you see breasts um, and you see the kind of flesh toned um, skin, right? But in, in here you sometimes see you know she's given nipples and um, I don't think it's consistent, but I think there are, are a number of scenes where she's you know she's you know nipples are drawn. And um, the whole thing just seems to be uh, a necessary, gratuitous, um, uh, kind of a weird, uh, overt example of of, of the Vegeta being very male gazy. You're right. It is male gazy, and I don't think it's 100 percent gratuitous. I think it does serve at least some function. It does demonstrate her vulnerability in some of these scenes, which I think is very important. I'm just wondering if that vulnerability could have been represented otherwise. Um, but you know, at the same time, I think that the way that she's drawn naked, I mean, yeah, you mm-hmm. do get to see some of the details, but you don't see her body on display in such a way, let's say in certain poses. In, in in a way that I think is overly erotic, and I would – if we did see the naked Florence Nightingale in more provocative poses, 
at certain places in the narrative, then I would say, okay, well, this is definitely you know gratuitous. Um, but I think that there there are occasions where she's naked that it's not necessarily to titillate as much as it is. Uh, to show her vulnerability. Now, I'm not making an excuse for the nakedness of Florence and Nightingale. I mean, I do think that it's, you know, bottom line, yeah, probably more gratuitous than otherwise. Uh, although I do think that her nakedness at certain places serves some purpose. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. You know, I, I agree that it's not, um, it's not necessarily meant to, to, to titillate in a way that, um, it would be if she was maybe posed more kind of provocatively or uh, sexually um, in a way that that um, you, you sometimes see in, in like Milo Manara comics where these characters are appear to be performing for the audience. Um, I, I don't think there's any th- any of that in the book, and um, but at the same time, I don't know if it's totally necessary. And I, I think you raise an interesting point. By saying that it does kind of um, evince a vulnerability of the character, but that's interesting to point out, and I think that those kinds of sexual politics are in and of themselves problematic because if we understand the reason for that or the effect of that um, that kind of device or that 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 met mode of rendering her her naked body. Um, as being to reveal her vulnerability, but we don't see any any men or any other characters. You know, we see other true, women true. Um, with with eidolon. We well, we we see Florence Nightingale talking about other women's eidolons, but we don't see any other women. Um, and so, what you have is the only woman we ha- we see with an eidolon is rendered as naked, as or you know, as rendered as vulnerable. Whereas as the men in the book. We see with eidolons are not. They're fully clothed. They're standing confidently. They're ready to engage in a duel, a combat of, of will and strength. Um, and so I, I, I think that – I hadn't really thought about that, but that's an interesting reading of that. But at the same time, if we understand the book that way, it's also very problematic. Um, Though I, I think that may be giving a little little bit too much credit. I, I don't know if I saw um, – uh, I don't know if I personally saw enough in the book to, um, to, uh, to read things like that as, as deeply as you did. But um, I, I, think that's, I think that's definitely a, a conversation worth having about this, about this book. Uh, but you, you, you definitely um, – thought about it more than more than i did i i um it, like i said i i didn't really have too many uh too much to say ab- about this one just just those little moments of art i really enjoyed mm. we had to say hussy her the night and all my friends were there and in the midst of the spirit lights they told us a to be way Sat there for nearly an hour, and nothing would appear. And then I heard the medium say, he said, son, your ghost is here. Then let's move on to the very last book that we're going to be discussing this month. And this is also a Kadansha book, Neo-Parasite F., and mm-hmm. this is a collection of stories by a variety of, of different creators. And, you know, I mentioned a second ago that uh, this, along with The Black Museum, The Ghost and the Lady, book one, came out this month. Actually, Neo Parasite's uh, release date, according to Amazon, is November 8th. So by the time you're listening to this, uh, it may not be out yet, uh, but it's something worth checking out. Now, Shay, did you have any experience with the original Parasite by Hitoshi Awaki? I don't, and that was something that we were talking about before we started recording. Um, you know, Neo Parasite F is a kind of tribute anthology that uh, collects basically fan comics by a number of of mangaka. There's there's quite a few uh, stories collected here, and each one ends with. Um, 
you know, after the story ends, there's there's a page devoted to the the author of that that story's name, right? And their kind of body of work. But then also they have these leave these comments, and we were talking about earlier that all of these cartoonists were talking about. I've been reading this book since high school. This is such an important work for me. I love this book so much. And it, that struck me as really strange because Parasite is a book that I have I've never ever heard about. It's a book that apparently ran from 88 to 95, mm-hmm. you know, it ran it ran for 10 volumes and apparently it was very very popular in Japan and it's been translated in English. Um but it, it's you know, it's a title I was not it's only no bad, longer in print, I, I don't think, is it? Um I'm not sure. Sh- Sure. Um, it says Kodansha USA has the rights to it. Um, I, Actually, I, I it is. It is in print. You're right. You're right. Okay. Um, but I, you know, to answer your question, I had no knowledge of the series. I'd never heard of it before. But not only that, I was really surprised that I'd never heard of it before because it's it is apparently such a, a popular series. Um, in Japan, and it's been available in English by you know several times. I know Tokyo Pop has translated it, and apparently Del Rey translated it, and then Kadansha has published it as well. Um, so yeah, I was I was really uh, I was really stunned by the fact that I had never heard of this apparently very popular manga. Um, but had had you were you familiar with this title at all? Had did this come across your radar or? Well, I didn't read it, but I'd heard about it again in doing okay. research on classic horror manga or horror manga that was quite popular. I had seen references to this, but I had not mm-hmm. read the original Parasite. And from what I've gathered in, in looking around, basically the premise of the original Parasite series of um, of uh, Iwaki's is that. This it, 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 it's a sci-fi title horror slash horror title where you have this parasitic creature or these creatures that come to Earth and one in particular um, infests uh, a, a boy by the name of Shinichi and he doesn't get into Shinichi's brain he enters through I think originally it was the right hand I think. Because there's a question whether it's right or left depending on the publisher. Uh, because I think Tokyo mm-hmm. Pop uh, published it in terms of the left to right reading sensibilities of Western readers, and so it inverted the direction of the character Shinichi and, and which hand it infected. But but anyway, mm-hmm. it infects his hand, and so basically you have a parasite that doesn't take over. Uh, Shinichi, but becomes a part of Shinichi, and so it's this relationship, right, between parasite and human host, and they do develop this kind of relationship that at times becomes uh, comedic, uh, but it definitely becomes uh, the point of drama between these two, and the parasite of Shinichi is called Migi, or Miji, M-I-G-I, which is a reference to the right, righty, um, and that's what I know about this, okay? Mm-hmm. And so that limited knowledge I brought to my reading of Neo Parasite F, and sometimes I could understand what the stories were referring to, at other times I had no clue. I do think that this collection, Neo Parasite F, could be better appreciated by people who were familiar with the original Parasite. Mm-hmm. Because in yeah, some of these that's... stories, I felt lost. Right, and that's that's basically how I felt as well. This is another book that I, I don't really have that much to say about it, precisely because I don't really feel qualified to to, to talk in any real depth about the series. You know, like you, the jokes and the characters and the references to events in the series um, were totally, totally lost on me. And so most I, – actually, I think I would say all of these stories really, for me, fell very flat. But I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I, I have absolutely zero knowledge of this series about what it's about, about its events. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that that this is potentially a, an anthology by if someone who's familiar with Parasite or is a fan of Parasite could could get a lot out of. And I do appreciate that there are so many stories in the in the anthology, and mm-hmm. um, there's a really incredible diversity of of aesthetics and storytelling styles on display in the, this anthology. And um, so, so yeah, like I, I didn't really get much out of it. I don't really have much to say about it. 
But um, I think a Parasite fan, someone familiar with the series, would get a lot out of it because I right. think there's a lot there. Yeah, and you know, this is not the only recent example of something from Kadansha, a collection of stories that pay tribute to. Uh, an earlier title. So here we have Neo Parasite F paying tribute to, with a variety of different manga creators paying tribute to the original Parasite. But earlier in October, we had the publication of Attack on Titan Anthology, and or, or the book is called Attack on Titan Anthology, which is a collection of shorter work by Western creators uh, in honor of repaying tribute to the Attack on Titan series. So you have people uh-huh. like Scott Schneider, Gail Simone, Cameron Stewart, Faith Aaron Hicks, and a uh, friend of the show, Evan Dorkin, who are doing stories about or based on Attack on Titan, but in a variety of different ways, like lighthearted and whatnot, and, you know, especially in the case of Dorkin. Uh, so that's something I think that may be more available or at least to be on the radar of more Western readers than Neo Parasite F for the reason that the creators who contribute to Neo Parasite F are all manganka, right? So they, they and if, if someone doesn't really read manga, they may not recognize the names or the works of these creators. And in fact, let me ask you of, of the, of the list here, did you recognize anybody? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, you know, not only are there so many kinds of of, of mangaka working here uh, in different in different styles and different kind of genres and with different visual you know styles, but they are I think every single one of them are people I've never heard of. I I'm not even sure if if uh, most of these um, cartoonists have been ever been translated to English before. Um, I've never like uh, like I said each uh, each story ends with a kind of brief summary brief brief bibliography for each of these authors and I don't I don't think I'd he- even heard of a single one of these titles um, so yeah I mean I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to take a look at some of this cartooning that uh, I, I by people I, I don't believe are are even available in any way shape or form in English or, or they may be and I, I've They've totally flown under my radar, um, but yeah, I, these I haven't I haven't heard of of a single one of these uh, mangaka. Yeah, now, um, was there was there anyone in here that that you might have heard of or? No, no, there wasn't. So I was curious if if you were familiar with any of the contributors to to this collection. And you know, like you, you know, I'm not familiar with the original Parasite, and I think that we agree that. One of the potential drawbacks of Neo Parasite F is if you're not familiar with the original Parasite, that much of what goes on in this collection may fall out of your realm of understanding. I think you can still appreciate mm-hmm. most of these stories and get something out of them. It would just help to have a knowledge or at least some kind of awareness of the original series. However, I think one of the great benefits of this collection, even if you're not familiar with Parasite, is, well, first and foremost, it will have you wondering what Parasite was all about, so you may seek out the original, which I think is a good thing. But along with that, it uh, introduces us to a variety of different mangaka, the individual contributors, that we may not have been aware of. And maybe some of their work is available in English, maybe not, but I think that if you're taken by you know, one or more of these stories, then you would be apt to seek out the work of, mm-hmm. of some of these creators. And I think that that's a great thing. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good opportunity for people to um, discover uh, new mangaka that they, they may be able to get in English or may be able to buy um, Japanese language editions of, of their work. And, and there were a number of, of, of cartoonists who who I would be interested in, in reading more by uh, their their particular stories here may not have grabbed me um, but you know like we said it, it that I think that has a lot to do with the fact that they were working with subject matter that was so it's so inside baseball for something I have so little knowledge about right um, I, I really couldn't even come close to appreciating any of the jokes or references or or anything like that um, yeah. but yeah I, I absolutely agree that that um, you know, if someone gets the opportunity to pick this up, it it you know, if even if they don't know about Parasite or they don't find that these stories in particular are really gripping, um, it's a great opportunity to discover new cartoonists, and that's always you know that's always great. 
Right. Now, there are 15 stories in this collection, and I, I don't want to go down the road of asking, oh, what are your favorites? Uh, I do want to point out one, though, that really struck me. I mean, you can tell me if, uh, you know, one that really stood out to you. Um, my favorite in, in different ways, in strange ways uh, of this collection is Mickey Maki, and that is the, the single name of this creator, Mickey Maki, um, Forbidden Fun. And this comes in the last half maybe the last third of the collection. And this is one of those stories that actually does uh, include the main characters of, of uh, the original series of, of you know, I- I- Iwaki, Iwaki's uh, original parasite. So you have uh, Shimichi and Migi. Okay. So Migi is the parasite on his right hand. And, in this story, basically, <laughs> what you have is uh, Shimishi is basically chilling out, lying in bed, and Migi Mi, – I don't know if it's Migi or Miji. I, I'll say Miji, M-I-G-I. So Miji is reading something, and I, I guess it's a catalog of some sort because he's talking about cooking or domestic work or whatnot. And then eventually they get into a conversation about young girls' bloomers, and that's what they call them, bloomers. And so then Miji begins to talk about bloomers, arguing that uh, Shinichi is fascinated by bloomers, and, and, and Miji knows this because he's attached to Shimichi, but Shimichi doesn't want to admit that he's turned on by bloomers. And, and it does become almost an erotic conversation, right? Because Miji is almost agging Shimichi into admitting that he's really turned on by young girls' bloomers and, and seeing them in gym. And then Miji takes the form of... A bloomer, and we should mention here that in the world of parasite, parasites are very flexible and fluid, right? So they can take different shapes. They can grow. They can shrink. Uh, they can look very grotesque, or they can look quite cute. And in fact, the way that Miji is drawn in this story, be- before he or it turns into a bloomer, uh, I mean, it looks rather rounded and cartoony, right? It's like um, a slug with a single eye in a mouth. And then Miji turns into a bloomer. And so here you have, in essence, Shimichi with bloomers on his hand because Miji has taken the form of bloomers. And and, and again, this sounds strange if you're not familiar with the story. And Miji dares Shimichi to put on the bloomers. So apparently Shimichi has a thing, has a fetish for young girl bloomers. Miji senses this. Miji takes the form of bloomers and then convinces the host, Samichi, to put on the bloomers. And <laughs> I mean, that that's just kind of weird. And then we have mm-hmm. this large panel on the very last page where Shimichi is standing in front of a mirror looking at himself in these bloomers. But the bloomers basically is Miji. And Miji's neck or head that the eye is attached to is sticking out. And so it looks like Shimichi is definitely turned on and has an erection wearing the bloomers. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was just completely whacked out. Uh, but yeah, there's a number of stories that, that – um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's not a lot where you see um, Miji kind of uh, jokingly affect, like approximating a, an erection um, – but uh, there are there are a number of stories that are that are very very strange. There's very funny. There's one where Miji is. It's like four pages, I think, where Miji is doing like a like a cooking show segment. Am I remembering that correctly? Do you know? Maybe I yeah, with that, with, uh, know with with a chicken and uh, egg recipe. Is that what you're talking about? Right, right. And it's like super brief. Um, it's only like three or four pages. Um, that you know, there's there's a number of stories like that that are just really off the wall and and bizarre and and um, they speak to a, a sense of humor that is very offbeat. Um, Parasite that, food. That's the name of it. Is story number six. Uh, it, it makes me curious about about the sense of humor in if, if in the, the original Parasite is if that is something that um you know these individual cartoonists are bringing to it or if that is an element that is kind of present in 
in the original series because it is it's something you see in a number of stories in the book this really strange goofy kind of uh sense of humor yeah exactly and you know there's some of these stories that do have this kind of comedic offbeat weird tone to them and others that are a little more serious but i think the bottom line for this collection is that here we have a variety of different creators who are paying homage to parasite and doing it in ways that you know they feel best about it so if they read the story in terms of the comedic element then that comes out in the story's tone if they see it as a little more serious or more dramatic then it comes out in those stories so, I mean, I, I think that this is a great collection. I just wish I knew of the series Parasite uh, before uh, having read Neo Parasite F. And I wonder, why is it called Neo Parasite F? You and I were discussing this before we turned the mic on. The Neo, okay, new, that makes sense. New Parasite stories. Where's the F come into play? I, I like I said, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, like like you mentioned, we we talked about this briefly on the show. And neither one of us could really figure out what the, the, it might have some significance in the series Parasite. It might have some significance um, in, you know, I don't know, like Japanese publishing. I I, I have no clue. Um, it seems to me, at least, like a kind of arbitrary uh, choice in title. But it's it's got to be, you know, it's. It's got to be a, a decision by someone for some reason. I just I can't I can't uh, suss out what it is. Yeah. But um, but you're right. This this might this is a series that um, I it definitely may be interested in going back and looking at uh, the original Parasite series. And it, this might be worth revisiting uh, after having done that when I when I know what these these mangaka are talking about. I agree. <laughs> Well, Shay, this has to be the longest manga episode we've ever done. Uh, we have been going on for over two hours now, and, and it doesn't yep. seem that way. But then again, we were dealing with quite a number of texts this month, which is yep. different from what we usually do. We started off with uh, Hideshi Hino's classic Hell Baby. After that, we looked at Junji Ito's Fragments of Horror. Then we turned to Lychee Light Club by Usumoto Furuya. After that, a weird, creepy, game-based manga, Portis, by Junabe. And then we looked at two recent publications from Kadansha, The Black Museum, The Ghost and the Lady Book One by Kazuhiro Fujita, and then wrapped up with Neo Parasite F by a variety of different creators, most of which, I think all of which, we have uh, not yet encountered. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good books here, a lot of great Halloween season reading, so check them out. But, you know, you don't have to wait until Halloween to read these books. And you know where you can find great manga? At the site of our sponsor, and that is Discount Comic Book Service. Be sure to go to dcbservice.com, and there you're going to find great prices on a variety of different manga titles, some of which Shay pointed out at the top of the show. But you can also find other comics there as well. And after you do get your manga there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about this month's Horror Halloween episode. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. You can also email the both of us at two guys at comicsalternative.com. You can email me specifically at Shay at comicsalternative.com. And Derek, where can they go if they want to reach you? Email me at Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can find us all over social media such as Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. 
You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, when you go to our website, which is comicsalternative.com. A lot of ways for people to contact us, and we appreciate it when you do. So, yeah, let us know if you think this month's episode was too long. Uh, we did deal with quite a number <laughs> of books, but I had a good time. Yeah, I had a great time. I thought this was a really fun conversation. Yeah, so uh, it definitely does whet our appetite for more horror, and we'll definitely be discussing more horror manga in the months to come. But until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. We'll see you next month.